Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we've got a special guest on again. We've got Kathy from Property Share Market Economics. You know that I've had her on the channel a few times before to discuss the property cycle, what's going on in the real estate market, land in particular, uh, the economics uh, that's going on in Australia and overseas, because that's what the company does. Property Share Market Economics looks at the overall 18.6 year cycle. And you know that I reference this little book back here quite often, which we'll look at during the stream, uh, basically looking at the cycle, which is going to lead us into the peak of the stock and real estate market. So Kathy, thank you once again for joining us here on the channel to explain and decrypt everything that's going on out there. Yes, thanks, Jason. And when you said the, the real estate market, I thought you were going to say the, the real economy. What's really, <laughs> really going on out there amongst all the crap that we uh, hear and see. So I'd love to hear about to that as well. Broadly. Yeah, let's get, get into it. <laughs> All right. Um, you guys know what to do. If you find value, hit that like button down below, subscribe. And uh, Kathy's also got their YouTube channel, Property Share Market Economics, which you guys can follow. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. So they cover the 18-year cycle, hitting the mark every single time. So let's, um, let's dive into the first piece, property. We can dispel the myths and then dive into the real, the real market going on so what are we seeing at the moment what's uh you know what, where are we at in the cycle first and maybe just touch okay. on the cycle because you've got some slides there sure. that people are unfamiliar yeah. with the cycle I, I want to show this one first jason because uh, it, it is the shape of the 18.6 year cycle on on average it goes from 18 18.6 years mm -hmm. and a, a very quick recap is the beginning of the cycle, a seven year expansion into a mid cycle peak and then into a mid cycle slowdown. And then a second on average seven years expansion into the ultimate peak and then a, a major crash. And it's a land led crash. So it's a land led value recession. And when I say land led, it's because it, the US land values is what leads the cycle and US land values peak at the end of the cycle and then start to plummet down for around four years. So I've got the previous cycle years uh, up until the end of World War II. Uh, so you've got the 1955, 1974, 1993, and then the last cycle, 2011, when our current cycle started. Note I've got 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, being this is where we are, 2020 and 2021, we're in a mid-cycle slowdown. The, the, the type of slowdown and recession that punctuates the middle of this 18.6-year cycle. This is where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to the next slide. It might just show it a little bit easier. Um, there's our 2020 peak, and this is where we are right now and then the second part. So I want to talk about right now. That's your question. Where are we now? And we're at mid of this cycle. When in the mid of the 18.6 year cycle, the, it's a confusing time for people because yes, in some cycles there's a recession, in other cycles um, it's a slowdown in Australia. It's not necessarily a recession, but this particular one, it has been uh, pretty well in most Western countries. And it's not land price led. So real estate prices may slow down, they may go sideways, but they don't necessarily have a decline. And that's what's happened. And in mm -hmm. fact, what what has occurred, because we're now coming to the, the, the end of this current mid slowdown, mid uh, recession period, we're seeing in Australia a just a, a massive takeoff in property prices. Now, not everywhere, mind you. You still need to choose, you know, the right location, the right type of property. But what's occurring now is speculation, mm -hmm. speculation in land prices. Hence, why you've got regional areas that are now really lifting in prices. And, and you, the listeners, you might say, well, it's because of the pandemic. It's because people are moving out of cities into country areas. If you go back in history, 
in every second half of the cycle, regional areas and coastal areas have always started to lift in prices in this second phase. Always uh -huh. have. It's because speculation kicks in to a much greater degree in the second half of the cycle. So all of this was due to occur, um, pandemic or not, it was due to occur. Now, the pandemic has created more fear. Granted, it's created more fear, hence mm -hmm. the massive 40% uh, panic de decline in last March and uh, this then bounce off with uh, recovery in, in the share market from there. It's all fear-based. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's created a little bit more of a panicky situation, but uh, it, it, this is not anything out of the ordinary to what's occurred historically. Right. So essentially, this is all just a repeat it's not exactly the same in terms of what has caused it, uh, but the cycle is pretty much on track. And so whenever we see stuff around double dip recessions, money printing, all these other bits and pieces, bond yields, etc., it's all just part of this cycle turning. And this is the, the beginning of the second stage, the second expansion phase. And we are seeing signs of that now. So we're not going to be getting any sort of double dip property prices aren't coming down in 2021 nor are they coming down in 2022 23 24 this is just going on and on and on until we hit around 2026 yeah yes a good good summary there's a few things there um mm -hmm. we we are expecting this to go up into 2026 now this 2026 time frame is where we we believe what's likely to occur is us land values to top in the year 2026. Okay, we'll know a bit closer US... to that date. We'll know yeah. whether it's oh, the beginning oh, yeah, of the yeah. year or end of the year. Yeah. So yeah, we're still about we five an... years away from that. Yeah, we have an idea of, of when we, we think. Now, that doesn't mean that the share market's going to peak in 2026. Okay. okay. But it, what it does mean is that they after 2026, US land values will start to come down. The share market will probably still be on its way up and we're looking at a peak in the US share market around the 2027 mark. Again, we'll know more about that as we get closer to it. But it's the beginning. It's the it's the beginning of this massive, really scary down downturn. But we're not we're not near that yet, right? So we've got in big terms, big growth to come. So that's right. So in terms of Australia, mm -hmm. um, yes, we we will continue to see this going up. But vol there'll be volatility around, no doubt. Sure. No doubt. And I and I do think that in 2024, we will see some kind of a um, uh, little bit of a decline and some some kind of uh, might, might be a little bit of a panic, a little bit of an upset in 2024, 2025, but nothing that's going to stop. The first sort of shakeout, occurring. the first sort of shakeout before we get into that final winner's curse phase. I think we'll be around 2024, early 2025. All yeah, right. Any I reason really for, for that? Yes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, look, in, in Australia, and perhaps I'll stop sharing my screen now. In Australia, uh -huh. um, Melbourne and Sydney, uh, they tend to have this seven-year peak-to-peak in property prices. Seven-year peak-to-peak-to-peak. Now, if history is to repeat, that next peak, that next top, before some kind of sideways action or small decline is 2024, the latter half of 2024. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, the other thing is, it's also the beginning of a, the, let me share my screen again, the beginning of the winner's curse phase. Yeah. And uh, this, this winner's curse phase here. So you'd start to see volatility and then a major zoom up after uh, 2024. So it's it's coinciding with that, but it doesn't mean it's the end. It's just really the bit of volatility. You know, you've got to have some kind of breakdown before the last zoom up into the final growth period. Yeah, before... I can see it with the, the emotions of the investors where we've come into this, we've had such a good run for three, four years then you've got to have some sort of shakeout into the final top, whether it's a higher top or an equal top or a slightly lower top in terms of pricing. 
And that gives people that extra hope to think, wow, this thing is really not going to end. And then we get the end because everyone is piled in. It happened the same pretty much every cycle I can I can remember or oh, have studied. That, yeah. Yes, that's right. And, and, you know, even for guys out, out there that are watching this, if you just go back to the previous cycle, if you go back to 2004, 5, 6 and 7, you'll see exactly that. Hmm. You'll yeah, see I, this. I was working in real estate at that time and I remember right. I was only 19, 20 and the guys in the office, you know, 30, 35 selling real estate, like, yeah, this thing's not going to end. It's all sold, blah, blah, blah. Just, you know, now you've got to buy, otherwise you'll never be able to afford a property again. And, you know, obviously we know history shows us cycle ended, but in Australia, we were so in a cocoon here that our property prices basically stagnated just with the, the mining boom, whereas everywhere else just got destroyed and so looking at commodity cycles as well which we might get into but i think we want to just chat about the just cover some of the other myths where you know people are a lot of talking about mm. bonds got to do this job keepers got to do that but all it's going to get mm. to is in the commodity cycles that is also peaking at around the same time as the property cycle the land cycle so yeah. before we get into that do you know much you know do you want to do shall we chat a bit a little bit about the the yields and the bonds increasing uh, yeah, how yeah. that how that affects the cycle or uh, why look, it's just yeah. it's just some normalizing you know it's nothing mm. to worry about it's just some normalizing now you mentioned you know money printing uh, uh -huh. it's it's money Interest creation it's increasing yeah yeah but it's it's cre it's the creation of money within the yeah. system you know you've you've got the reserve bank of australia uh buying government bonds you know it's just uh, you, the Reserve Bank of Australia and the federal government, they're one of the same. It's just conflated, you know, they're not two separate entities. They're just really one of the same. It's it's in, in countries that have um, their own currency like Australia, you, those countries can create their own money. They just create it and they can then flow it into the community. Now that's a really good thing to occur when there's times in the economy where we really need it, like recessions, you know, what we've just, we're going through. With unemployment being high, so employment, full employment being low, it's important that these sovereign countries with their sovereign currency can create it and put it into the system. That's a really good thing. It doesn't mean there's going to be inflation. The only, let's get clear on this. The only mm. time that inflation will actually start to kick in is when the money flow outweighs the production. So at the moment, the money, let me say that again, the, when the production outweighs the money flow, okay? That's, yes. That's, so at the moment, production's low because unemployment is high. Yeah. That's why we need money flow into the system. Now, when production starts to become greater than the amount of money that's in the system, then we'll get inflation. And that's not what's happening now. That's not what's happening. So at what point until... do we see that? Are there, what are the signals that we gen genuinely see when production grows so much that it outweighs the money inflow? Yeah, yeah. Just look at employment figures. Employment Just figures, employment. all right. Yeah. So and when right unemployment... employment figures are okay. Yeah. Well, employment, we're, we're still really, our unemployment figures are still high. Uh -huh. Okay, so one, so whilst they're still high, uh, we this money creation and going into the system is a good thing because it's, right. it, it's to be used for production. Right, so then the unemployment drops. If we're still printing too much money, production then increases too far. We get the inflation. The rest is history. Yes. Okay, one more thing to add to that. Yeah. The only way, the only way we'll get inflation is if taxes are not increased mm -hmm. to balance to balance up money flow and production. Okay, so if taxes aren't increased to stop the flow into the system, to stop people spending money, if that doesn't occur to keep that balance between money flow and production, we will get inflation. Okay. So yeah, it's inevitable that taxes are going to increase with this money printing. At what point we have to figure that one out? That's right. How does that uh, then weigh into credit creation? Because obviously that is a, a big driver for the land cycle. 
and for yes. the prices of land yes. and real estate to increase? Yeah, good question. Now, I'm, I'm hoping I can explain this really easily. You will. <laughs> the majority of credit that's created by banks, because banks create credit, they don't mm. loan things out, they create credit. The majority of, of, of credit creation that banks focus on is for the purchase of land. So I'm talking about there's land and then there's the house on top. Okay, yeah. so people think I just buy one thing. Well, you're actually buying two things. You're buying yeah. land and the house on top. Now, in relation you're buying, to inflation, you're buying a depreciating asset, which is the physical structure, and then you're buying an appreciating commodity, which is the land. And so right. when the banks lend, yes. Yes, they're lending towards both. So you've got mm. the it's exactly right. The building's depreciating, the land is appreciating. Now, mm. when you relate it to inflation, when you relate it to that. In our current economic system, land prices are not included in the analysis of our economy. It's not land prices are not included. The building on top is, the depreciating asset on top is included, but not the land. So a simple test of that, go, go to how um, the CPI is, is assessed and calculated. It's all about construction. It's nothing to do with land. They do not include the price of land and how land is inflating in value within the figures. And so more credit continues to be created. Land prices continue to go up and it's, it is all warped. It, it's, it doesn't make sense, but that will continue to occur until it doesn't. And that will be after 2026. That's where we get the peak. So ton of credit is continue to be created because we are continuing to try and bolster boost the production and then the production is the house itself yes, yes. yeah yes, and because right. that keeps depreciating we can keep printing more money but unfortunately the depreciating asset is sitting on top of an appreciating asset well it's, a, it's actually a depreciating liability but um yeah, the asset continues to go up as well because people need the land in order to be productive on the land. And so the production increases the value of the land. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. I think there's, if there's one thing that, that our listeners can, can try to understand is that mm -hmm. land is treated very differently to the building on top. And if we can really see that there's a difference between the two, you'll start to understand why these cycles occur and how warped it really is. And why at the end of the, at the, end of the cycle, it's such a massive destruct, destructive decline All in right. a much bigger way to what happens in the mid cycle. All right, so we've basically covered the hows and the whys as opposed to looking directly at all of the small detail of the bonds increasing and the yield curves are doing this and all these other little things which just distract people from smoke and actual, mirrors smoke and mirrors smoke and mirrors yeah. because yeah. because and i mean people will probably get take offense to that because it's the main thing that everyone looks at but i guess my reasoning to that is that those figures continue to change or at least the way that we interpret that data and so one time it's it does this the next time it does that it doesn't, it, there's no consistency really. People can pull consistency from it, but at the end of the day, the real reason is the credit of, crea the creating creation of credit from the banks. That's, that's exactly right. It, look, you know, journalists, and I'm not putting anyone down here, but I am, I no. suppose. But journalists have to create headlines for, for us to read their story. And I do the same thing on YouTube. And I hope to give information underneath all of yeah, those those yes. headlines. So uh, but yeah, but you know, um, gosh, it confuses people, doesn't it? And especially, it sure if, does, yeah. especially if the information that's then being provided is just not accurate. It's just creating a drama and uh, upset and fear. Mm. And it's and the the thing about understanding this eighteen point six year cycle and where credit mm -hmm. relates to it and mm -hmm. where land relates to it that one yeah think about link, understanding that a link to that in the description now. it sounds like we're holding up our bibles and we've got to do some bible bashing telling people to get that <laughs> yeah the, th the link to understanding that means and I'll, I'll keep holding this up also is that you don't have to 
be wrapped up in this emotional roller coaster ride, mm. uh, trying to understand. Trying uh, to bring the all these pieces of the puzzles together, and then how does the yeah. puzzle change and move? And this time is different. So let's let's move on to some of the other pieces that uh, yes. tend to come up in the Aussie economy, and then we'll also touch. Well, we'll go into U.S. stuff as well because that's primarily what the cycle is based on. Because the U.S. is the biggest economy, which then obviously drives everything else. Uh, we've all heard the saying that if the U.S sneezes everyone else catches a cold but let's start with the the little things in australia and i call them little things because everyone's hyping them up job keeper ending end of march i think it is i don't know where they're getting any extensions on any of this stuff does that really matter we obviously know the answer is no but why and, yeah. and how and mm. etc go on the the airline industry their job seeker uh support they're getting an extension with the airline industry i do understand that um uh, I can't see there being a major uh, issue uh, occurring in the economy just because uh, job seeker or job keepers ending. Uh, Why? It's, they're not, look, do you know how much, how, how, do you know the number of extra deposits that our Australian population have made in the last 12 months? Go on. I don't. 115 billion. How? There's an extra. How? Yeah. Uh, I think it relates to the 140 billion in uh, job keeper payments, job seeker payments. What it's done, it's created uh, people to actually save money, actually have more money for themselves, an extra 115 billion. So, so that couldn't be all JobKeeper. I guess if we're all locked down, then we don't have much to spend on. And you guys, unfortunately, in Victoria, Melbourne, locked down for six months. You, you can't spend your money on anything. Well, there's like, <laughs> you should have seen the amount of courier vans going past my street every day. We people were having <laughs> online, things sure. delivered yeah. Yeah, online. So yeah, people were still spending, don't you know? You can't say they weren't, they, have, they absolutely were. We're a strong economy. In, mm. really we're, we're not a third world country we are a strong economy and we do have a government that has been uh, creating this money and putting it into our economy enabling people to save or spend so no I don't think any, much is going to happen in terms of a, a collapse once job keeper uh, or job seeker ends it's that, that is not not going to occur Right, because people, the, the main thing that people say to that is, or, you know, analysts, economists say that, well, if JobKeeper is ending, then there's going to be backlogs on people's mortgages, yeah. uh, on their rent payments, which then leads to the mortgages. No one can pay their mortgages and they've got to be repossessed and then that's going to lead to a oversupply on the markets, et cetera. But, but, but they were saying all of, all of this in 2020. That's true. The same, the same argument was occurring in 2020. So yep. I, and, that, and that didn't happen. So no. Well, JobKeeper no, was there, and they was that's right, and they were still saying that people people aren't going to be pay, being able to pay for their rents. Uh, they were still saying all of those things. So I, right. I you know, it, the same they're saying the same thing for two different arguments. It doesn't stack up. Um, now production is increasing in mm. the Australian economy. We do have unemployment um, lower. So that is occurring. So we are moving towards a, a higher or more productive economy. That is occurring, not in any fast way, but that that is occurring. So what about when they? Uh, what about the unemployment figures when they pull them from different areas and change the way that the employment figures are, are calculated? It's still on the increase. Still on the increase, and right. and you've just you've just said something there, Jason. That that's the other thing you've. You know, when you're looking at these statistics and these figures, uh, where do they get them from? And figures can be construed to um, to answer any kind of question uh, to, to create the answer that you want. Sure, really. depending on who so, wants to win that argument. Th that's exactly right, which is why I come back to this 18.6 year cycle because it's been in existence for over 200 years. Mm -hmm. And it is occurring like clockwork. It, it has, it's not faltering. So mm. use that Use that as your framework. Use that. Uh, and not all the other 
economic data that just confuses us. Use the framework. Gotcha. Easy said. Done. Read the book. We've talked about it heaps of times. I have a link to that that book in the description every and almost every single one of my videos. Um, so yeah, check that out. Let's now chat about uh, say the rest of the world and interest rates. Because I think we're talking, there was some talk yesterday about interest rates going up in Australia. I think this is all part of the cycle again. Uh, the US has also talked about it going up, not next year, but possibly in 2023. Is that going to then lead to the, the crash earlier? Okay. Okay. So interest rates, when you break it down, interest rates are simply a cost of credit. It's just a cost of credit. It's your expense. You know, what if you, if you want to... Uh, get your hands on 500k, but well, your cost, your expense to doing that is what an interest rate is. It's just a cost of credit. Now, and right now, it's cheap to get that. Yeah. To get your 500 uh, yes. grand, it's cost you nothing. But then, if it goes yes. up to one, two, maybe three percent, it's going to cost us a hell of a lot, lot more. Yeah. Which then leads to people not being able to afford that because rate wages haven't gone up. Well, I'm yeah. I'm just going to share my screen again and go back to here. Remember the 80s? Oh, you won't remember the 80s. You're too young. I was born to in the 80s. the 80s. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I remember the 80s. Um, and I, I remember the uh, late 80s, early 90s. I was a, a young police officer at that time. And, you know, I was so, um, I felt comforted that I had a government job in the early 90s because interest rates were at 17 and 18%. Cost of credit was at 17 and 18 percent the unemployment rate was i think around nine nine percent but I, I please don't quote me on that i think it was around nine percent it was high and yeah it was high but what also was happening you know land prices you know skyrocketing and uh in the early 90s they did have a, a dip but prior to that interest rates you know going eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen seventeen eighteen percent um it's just the cost of credit now, at the end of every cycle leading into this winner's curse phase, interest rates do start to come up. That is one of the leading indicators. But so that's due around 2023, 2024. 2024, 2025. I'd say 2024, yeah. 2025, 2026, around. For the interest rates to start years. increasing. We might yeah, get a to, few to, little creep ups. Yes, for, yeah. for, it, to, for it to matter. It's, All right. It, it really starts to lift up towards the end of the cycle. If we get interest rates increasing, you know, in next year, 2023, 2024, it's not going, it's not the collapse. It yeah. is not the collapse. It's just a way of managing the, um, uh, the, the, the creation and flow of money. That's it. Okay. It's not a collapse. All right. So you're telling us about your, police officer story in the 80s and the property prices were going up that was a we, we had high interest rates at that time but it didn't start from a base of zero either so the, the main point there is that interest rates can increase but that usually happens towards the end of the cycle in a significant way which then leads to the crash so the the, the first signs of it are letting us know that we're getting closer but we could be a couple of years away from it oh absolutely absolutely right. yeah yes, it's not going to be I, I, yeah, it's again, it's it's going to confuse a lot of people. And and this is what's going to happen. Right. You know, so we're going to see those headlines out at that time. And it's going to be again, the stock, the stock market, the property market crash of 2022, the stock market, property market crash of 2023. And it's going to keep going and going and going until we actually and get there. And yeah, yeah. And it never happens. And because it doesn't happen, Mm. At, towards the end of the cycle, when it, things, economies pumping and there's high, high employment, you know, the production's really pumping and mm. you've got land values that are just out of this world. But because there was no collapse in the, in the years leading up to that, when they said there was and then there wasn't, you'll have the same conversations that you had, Jason, going into the GFC oh, we're yeah. never going to have another bust. It's just going to keep going. The government's done such a great job. Bank's doing such a great job. It's just going to keep going. I hope, I, I know it won't happen, but I hope that some people who are at least watching this will remember the same emotions, say from the crypto cycles, because it was the same conversations in 2017. This time it's different. 
uh, crypto has to go on this bigger run, you know, the bigger money's coming in, it crashed. We're in 2021 now, the cycle is, is cr crushing it. You know, we're, we're going up triple digits over and over again. The institutional money's coming in. We're having a super cycle. We're having a, a massive hype cycle. We're doing an S curve. We're never coming down from this point because it's not meant to be, you know, like, so it's the same stuff, but at least we're seeing it more regularly now, especially with the viewers here who are, you know, I do a lot more on cryptocurrency on the channel as opposed to uh, real estate cycles. So take that, all, all my lesson is here is take the emotional side that you see from crypto more often and then apply it to the stock market or the real estate market because we will see the exact same emotions happen again. Yes, it's the stock market, the real estate market, it's the whole, it, it's, it's everything that makes up the economy. Uh -huh. it, it really does. And the, it, to be philosophical about it, or it's not even philosophical, to be real about it, nothing ever goes up without coming down. It has yeah. to come down before it can have the next growth spurt. That's just, that's reality. That's, we're part of nature. That's life, mm. you know. But what we, what we want to know is when is it going to come down? And that's what we specialize in. When's it going to come down? Yeah, because you could say, well, we've we've had a pretty good run out of 2020 or even 2019. You know, the, the markets here have done very, very well. It's like, at what point do you sell out? And you sort of miss that last part of the run because once the, prop, the prices on anything come back down, maybe they only ever come back to that level that you sold out at. So you're not really making anything. So to understand this, this framework for the land cycle, at least you can get the vast majority, what I what we know of as being the lion's share of the cut and sell and then have some cash yes. on the sidelines to reinvest. We're never going to pick the exact top, but I think we can get very, very close to it with this 18 year cycle. Yes, you're right, Jason. <clears throat> we don't want to we don't want to pick the top. And in fact, if if you're in early enough, you don't need to pick the top. Exactly. I did that with if Bitcoin, you... Ethereum, it's just buying in the accumulation stage and then just write it out. Yes. Write it out. Yes. You, yes. You got to follow the trend for sure, um, yeah. but you've got to be open-minded enough and objective enough and unemotional enough to identify when the trend has changed. And that's that can be oh, hard when everyone's it, saying the opposite. <laughs> Definitely, especially with what I'm sure we will see in that 2025, 2026, as I remember from 2006, seven nuts. Absolutely crazy. Yes. Um, yes. Last last bits and pieces before we sort of wrap it up, but I want to get into, say, the US or the UK market. Does this all sort of apply to that? Because the similar questions that I get in the comments are, oh, you know, my my town of some random place, even in Australia, some random small town, oh, we're going down. Or it's where Northern Territory, someone commented like, oh, we're going up so much. Or, you know, generally speaking, US, UK, very similar to Australia. Or Australia is very similar to them, I should say. Australia is similar to them. So U US yeah. is the largest economy in the world. Um, yeah. it, the US does lead the the overall world economy. And and I, I'm thinking China here. Well, ch it, once China really becomes part of the Western, if it does, Western world's financial system, um, then there'll be similar, you know, similar timings. But at the moment, the US is still the largest economy. So the US leads this. The mm -hmm. UK follows the US. Um, U the UK land prices also follow the US land prices quite closely. Australia's land prices, um, they, we have our own, uh, our own cycle. But at the end of the day, when the US economy made up of land share market jobs when that mm. comes crashing down uh, we all have to follow we just all, yeah we all do we, we we follow you cannot you cannot go opposite to whatever's happening in the us yeah so that's why we follow the us um first and foremost and then pick out areas that we're interested in like i'm on the gold coast so i choose this market same with brisbane and i just have to get a little bit more in tune with this market because it moves a slightly different timing, but overall, grand scheme of things, is into mid twenty twenties. Yeah, yes. we're on the money. Yes, on the money yes, yes, I, <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, look, look, the same. You still the same in, in terms of from an investment perspective, uh, choosing location and type. You still got to make sure you have your strict criteria as mm. an investor. 
you can't get away from that. You can't, you know, you don't, don't make a silly decision because you think it's just everything's going to go up. It still has to be sound. And the, sure. the, cap, the, the, the figures, the numbers have to all stack up. Got to get our feasibility done. It's same sort of thing. Don't don't be buying inner city apartments in Sydney, Melbourne, any of that sort of stuff, which is just sort of, there's so much there. Sure, they, they might go up, but your money may and probably will be better off elsewhere to get better returns. Um, do you want to just show your slide one last time and we'll wrap up just to say okay. where we where we are, where we're going, just as one final summary. And while you do that, I'll just mention uh, Property Share Market Economics. You can get a link to their YouTube channel down below. But essentially, you guys follow this. I mean, I've been following you guys for a couple of years now and Phil for almost 10 years. Um, Phil is the co-founder with yourself at Property Share Market Economics. Yes, and Akil Patel, who is Akil based. Akil Patel, in, I always leave him up. He's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, he's based, in, in, the he's UK. based in, in the UK. He's an amazing, he's absolutely amazing. Um, just as good as Phil yeah. uh, in terms of his understanding of history and applying it to now and to the future. Uh, he really is amazing. So with people to follow you, then they're going to have a better understanding of how this works, the signs to look for, how to control their emotions, because you can basically put all of the news that's coming out together in a simple plan. Yes, yeah. yeah. We do, we do a, a monthly newsletter. It's called the Boom Bus Bulletin, and uh, that's only 47 bucks a year. And mm. that that can... For, nice, for easy those, entry point. It's a really good entry point, and it will keep you um, just understanding where we are within the cycle from that more, more uh, 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 overarching side of things. You're a member of um, the the more in-depth service, Jason, yeah. and, and, and so that's when you get all our, our more uh, micro forecasts. Um, but from an entry perspective, the, the Beam Bus Bulletin really is a, a good one to do. Yeah, good starting point. So yeah, that, they can find a link to that in your YouTube videos? Yes. Yeah, yes, okay. Yes, yes. Good, good, good. Because uh, this is like, I mean, like I said, I've been following it for years. I'm not going to bang on about it too much more because I do that in every other video, but it's very easy to understand once you get the hang of this. Um, okay, so let's go with the final summary. We are here. Where to next? Next sign, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes. Okay. Uh, expect some volatility this year in the share market. Just expect And the US it. stock market? US stock market. Australian yep. stock market, just expect yep. some volatility. It's just going to come, you know, and there's reasons for that, but we won't, won't talk about that now. Just know it's going to come, but yep. it's not going to stop this from occurring. Yep. I hope you can see my arrow. Yep. So just, just understand that we are, if, if, don't be scared of these asset values that are going crazy. Don't be scared of that. It doesn't mean it crashes around the corner. Okay. It's so these, all part yeah. of what's meant to happen. It's what's meant to happen. It's, it will. So the, the valuations of these companies can get even more extreme, more crazy. Their P ratios are going to be way out of the waters. Um, uh, looking at property prices, say for Australia, because I've got a lot of Australian viewers, we've been really hot for the last six months, since about August. Can this keep going this year? Or are we going to maybe cool off? Not drop, but at least not be going up 20% every six months. We've gone up a lot here. Yeah, just bring it back to normal growth. Just bring it oh. back to understanding about the seasons. Just, just the seasons in nature. Seriously, mm -hmm. it's as simple as that. You know, in winter you have some decline to get ready for what happens after what happens after winter. Winter we got spring, you know, so that's when the property spring. prices. Yeah. Growth, and then you've got summer, which is whoo, you know, Crazy. and then you got autumn decline. So it's just it's the same type of thing. We, there will be some cooling off. I, do, I doubt there'll be a decline. Not not when no. we know credit is going to be expanding. Yeah, okay. and that's coming that, this year or next year, I and think. That, that's ab absolutely. It's actually going through the Senate right now about you know, mm. the, um, uh, the responsible lending laws. It's, going, it's being heard again in June. Um, so Let's touch on that in the next video because we can go into more credit then. But yeah, now yeah, we're at yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. This is the point. Um, yeah. heading up. It will, next... it, will call, it will call off, Jason, but it won't All decline. Right. That's where we are now. Let's catch up again, say like a month's time. If you guys have questions for your Aries, uh, not specifically the Aries, but the overall cycle where we are, if you've got some uh, concerns about the news that's out there, all the stuff that we keep hearing about bonds and double dips and all this sort of stuff, 
leave your questions down below. Go follow Kathy on Property Share Market Economics YouTube channel. Check out the Boom Bus Bulletin as well. Very easy entry point to understand these cycles. You'll receive monthly newsletters on that. And uh, stick around on the channel. Like the video if you found some value from it over here. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, bell notification icon. We'll see you guys at the next video. Thanks again, Kathy. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everyone. Cheers again. All right. Have a great one, guys. See you at the next one. Peace out.